together. The church is better together. Across boundaries and borders, beyond walls and notions, we're part of something far more powerful, far more potent than any of us could ever fully imagine or dream. A mission far bigger than any of us could ever accomplish on our own. We exist to make Jesus known. And in that pursuit, we become the best version of who God created us to be. A reflection of his love, his truth, his grace, his hands, his feet. One in mission, one in heart, one in love for Jesus and people. Arms locked to serve, give and show the world his love, which has no equal. And when we do, God goes before us. Hope rises, people turn their feet to Jesus. Families grow stronger, communities come together. Lives forever change for the better, victory is won. This is church, this is together, this is who we are. It's what we were made for. And all the glory goes to the one who makes it all possible. Jesus, to his name be all the glory, honor, and praise. Welcome to the movement, 2,000 years in the making. Welcome to church. What's up, everybody? Hey, how's it going? I'm Brian, one of the pastors here at church where you are. Hey, if you're watching with us live, check in. Check in with us. Drop your pin in the chat so we know what state you're checking in from. People all over the country checking in. Facebook and YouTube are live, obviously. We've got people in there, and we've got our church online platform. We also have our Church Where You Are app. Now, that's the place to go if you want to make this experience reach beyond today because this video is going to end. And what does that look like for your week? Hey, we want to walk alongside you. Church is people, everyone. So we want to get you connected. So if you want to do that, download our Church Where You Are app. Over 860 people so far across 13 different states and growing. We want to add your state to the mix as well. So join us there and let's get connected. Hey, we're kicking off a new series today. What's love got to do with it? I'm on the road, obviously. Heading to a gathering where we're going to witness that in action. What does love look like lived out in the Christian experience? Got invited to a home gathering where five families are gathering to do church together. So cool. Can't wait to share that with you next week. Are you guys ready to worship? Let's worship. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated 
I need to slow down. Worship gives us that opportunity to slow down and really take account of our environment a little bit. Look at our surroundings. Where's my heart in this moment? Am I over gripping life right now? Uh, so we're going to do that together, continuing in our worship in the Bible app uh, this week. So this is something that you're going to want to participate in. I, it's a great illustration because the Bible plan works with this name, this title. Love slows down. <laughs> love slows down. You're going to want to join us in this Bible plan uh, and slow down and learn to love, to love God more, to love people, to love our neighbor as ourself and to go and make disciples. That's our directives this week, everyone. So we're going to do that together in the Bible. And if you're new to the Bible app, there's a link in the chat you can click to join us. If you're already a friend of ours, guess what? We've already sent this plan invitation to your phone. So just hit accept. So we're also going to enter into a time of giving um, and this is important as well. I think there's moments where we have, where we we do this with our finances even, like right, we white knuckle it. We try and squeeze as much out of it as we can. And we become hyper-focused on that and we forget about all the blessings that God has in our life. Um, so giving gives us a chance just to, to do an audit. Where's the attention of our heart? Um, I was able to talk to um, to Debbie uh, in Ohio. She, she's a supporter of church where you are. And, uh, and the text message she sent me was God is in control. I have to remind myself God is in control. And I responded back to her text message and I said, Debbie, that is exactly what I needed to hear today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and we shared a couple of verses. I was able to share those, uh, with my spouse, Liz as well. And just a blessing. I love those conversations where we get to reach out to you. Um, those of you that have decided to support church where you are, to bring your gifts and tithes. Um, I, I love having a chance to check in with people and just hear about their life and what, how God is blessing them and, and just uh, the way that he is using them. Uh, we want you to know that church where you are is a tithing church. So of anything that comes into the church, we give back 10% to local communities and people in need. Um, family members right here within the church where you are network. So it's a big deal. And we know that, that, that honors God. And so we want to honor God with our giving in this moment right now. So if you're, if you're just a guest today, just checking us out or just getting used to this experience, this is not a time for you to feel like you need to participate. But for those of you who want to bring tithes and gifts, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can just use our app church where you are. And in the bottom right hand corner, there's a giving button. You can also still text to give. All you do is type 84321 is the number. And then in the text field, whatever dollar amount you want to send and send it, just choose church where you are as your preferred church. Just remember, guys, it's not about the amount that you're sending. It's about the position of your heart. God loves a cheerful giver. Will you go to prayer with me? Jesus, we come before you humbled. And Lord, we want to be, uh, to be your servants this week, Lord. And thank you for... Uh, providing us with jobs where we can can bring provision. Thank you for looking out for us. And Lord, for, for those that are in need, Lord, we want to be a blessing. Lord, so we're praying that anything that uh, comes into church where you are, Lord, is, is, is only used to honor and glorify your name and to advance your kingdom here. We know that um, you're going to exponentially use those tithes and gifts to do just that. And we want to honor you above all else, Lord. So thank you for the giving spirit, the generous spirit that pervades this audience. We're so grateful and thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do we give? We give to make a difference, to touch hearts and change lives. We give to feed the hungry, care for the sick, and comfort those in need. We give to show Jesus to our neighbors, our community, and the world. We give as an act of worship to a God who has given everything. 
We give because we are the church, the body of Christ, called to be a light in the darkness, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the hands and feet of Jesus, sharing the hope of the gospel. This is why we give. Well, hello and welcome everybody to church where you are. Come on, we are so glad that you are joining us today. For those that don't know me, my name is Jason Tucker. I'm one of the pastors here at Church Where You Are, and I'm excited that you are here today. Hey, do us a favor right now in the chat or the comment section, wherever you're watching from today, just type out right there where you're watching from. Maybe put your city or your state. Say hey to somebody. Come on, we love connecting people here in the Church Where You Are community because this is a growing community. Now, almost 800 downloads of the Church Where You Are app. People from California to the Carolinas, from Texas to Wisconsin, west, east, north, south, everywhere, um, all over the place engaging in this Church Where You Are community. So do us a favor, say hi in the chat, check in there today. We've got a host team here today um, in, on all of our platforms that are here to make your experience great. Uh, they want to answer any questions that you have about church where you are. Be an encouragement to you. Pray for you today if you need prayer. We're just really glad that you're here. So we're starting this brand new series today called What's Love Got to Do, Got to Do With It? Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you didn't know you were going to get sang to today. By, by the pastor of church. What's love but a second-hand emotion? Little Tina, come on. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, I'm excited over these next four weeks. We're going to be answering that question, what's love got to do with it? You know, it's the most wonderful, yet probably the most misunderstood action or emotion, if you will, in the world that we live in today. It's a word that we use to describe just about everything that we have fond feelings for or things that we enjoy. Like, let me give you some examples. I love these jeans, right? That's an example. I love these jeans. I love my dog. I love this latte. This latte, I just, I'm in love with it, right? Um, we love our spouse, we love our children. Come on, we love ice cream. Who doesn't love ice cream? Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, man. We love to water ski. Uh, we love to sleep in on Saturdays. There's so many things we love. But the question we're really asking ourselves, really two, first, is all that love the same? Are all those different kinds of love the same? And then the second question, which is probably even the most important question, is when was the last time that you felt loved? I'm going to say that again because I, I don't want you to miss that. That's a big question for today, really, and over the next four weeks. When was the last time that you truly felt loved? I'd love for you to think about that. Just take a second, maybe reminisce on what that felt like or what that meant to you when you truly felt loved and appreciated and cared for in that way. You know, um... Each week, we're going to be talking about one aspect of what the Bible has to say about this incredibly deep ocean called love. You know, the Bible really uses four different words. There are four different phrases here uh, in the Greek that, that mean love. And I'm just going to probably butcher these as I try to say them, but I'll show you a graphic so you can see what I'm actually talking about. There's philia, which means friendship love. There's sorge, which means familiar or family love. There's eros, which means romantic love. And then there's agape, which means perfect, unconditional love. Or I would even go as far as to say divine love. Love that only can come from God. 
Now, in each one of these aspects, obviously, they all make up this thing called love. And so you're going to see this diagram a lot over the next few weeks, but that's really the idea. Love is the word right there in the middle. And there's a bunch of different things that make up the fullness of what love really is. What's love? Come on. Got to do. Yep. That's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be trying to break each one of those down a little bit each week and ask ourselves the question. You know, uh, for me, is, is everything that I say that I love the same kind of love? What's the difference? Why does it matter? And when's the last time that I felt loved? Let me jump in with a passage today. Um, if you've attended a wedding, you've probably heard this. It's often labeled as the wedding love passage, but it's not really about weddings. It's just about love. And so I want to read this to you and then we're going to talk about it. 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 13, verse 4 through 8. The Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable it's, or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Another translation of the Bible says this, love never fails. Why is that important? You know, when you, when you read that passage, it, it makes a lot of sense when you're considering the closest relationships in your life. But when you think about all the different kinds of love, th this passage is saying love looks like this. This is what love looks like. This is an, an exemplification, if you will, of love. And so on all the different fronts, right? Philia, friendship love, sorge, family or familiar love, eros, romantic love, agape, divine or perfect, unconditional love. This is what love looks like. And I think it's really important because I've had a lot of people over the years tell me, Jason, I want to know about the deep truths of the Bible. Help me understand some of the deep things of scripture. And I'm telling you today, uh, this is <laughs> an eye-opening truth that I think each one of us need to grab hold of today as we jump in on this very first week of this series. Here's a list of all the things that Paul just said love is. Patient, kind, not envious or boastful, not arrogant or rude. And as you can see, that list, as it goes on, um, those things become a little more harder and harder, right? They become a little more difficult, right? Uh, for love to endure all things, really? Like, love never had, true love never has a moment where it says, that's, an, again, I wouldn't endure that. That true love is, uh, the truest form of love is, is a love that would endure all things. That's mind-blowing to me because I've had many times in my life where I said, I'm not going to endure that anymore. Uh, I've had many times in my life where my, I, I'm, like it says, hope's all. I've had many times in my life where I've run out of hope. I didn't hope for all, bear all or believe all. So uh, that is a very intriguing piece of scripture when you really think about it because it's, it's showing us the depths of love. And so with that in mind, I think there's a few things we need to have as a framework in our head as we talk about this today. Love is the deepest truth in scripture. Love is the deepest truth in scripture. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, most important of all, for clarity's sake, that means this is the most important thing of all. That's what it is for what it is. Take it for face value. It says, continue to show deep love, deep love, deep love, deep into the pool love for each other, for love covers over a multitude of sin. Love is a deep ocean. And for those of us that follow Jesus, we're going to have to understand this is the deepest truth, the deepest water we will swim in as Christ followers. It's, you know, Jesus said these words. He said, it's easy to love those who love you, right? He said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Think about that. Think about that. <laughs> that is deep end of the pool stuff, gang. The, the second piece of framework here, real quick. There is a lot riding on us loving each other deeply. There's a lot riding on this. It's a pretty important truth in scripture. 
So uh, I, I don't want you to miss that today. John 13, 35 uh, says this, Jesus' words. He said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So in other words, us getting this right is how the world around us knows that we are truly followers of Jesus. That's important. That's really important. Uh, we need to have a good understanding of love and a very deep appreciation for what it means. And then the last thing, uh, you know, before we really get into the meat and potatoes of this today, is this, loving God more is what makes loving people better possible. Jason, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say, based on those words that we just heard in 1 Corinthians, this is something that we should gather out of that. I won't be able to love people on my own power as deep as Jesus wants me to love them. I, I won't be able to. It's not in me. I don't naturally have it in me to believe all, hope all, endure all. You with me on that? Those aren't natural things for, for the love that I can give. No, the love that I am trying to give to other people as a follower of Jesus is love that's beyond me. It's been shown to me in Christ, but it's beyond me. I can't do it on my own, so we can't miss that today. Loving God more is what makes loving people better possible. 1 John 4.10 says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and that he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In other words, I'm not the source of this love, that, this deep, meaningful love that I could give to other people. My ocean is only so deep. It's, it's, uh, some days it's more like a, a baby pool. Some days it's like the shallow end of, of a swimming pool. Other days I can move into the deep end. But the love that Jesus had for us is oceans deep, gang. Oceans deep. And that's why this is an incredibly important series that we're going to be doing over these next several weeks talking about love. Okay, so I'm going to put this graphic up so we can work off this today. Love comes in these forms, right? All four of these, philia, storge, eros, agape, uh, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing all those right, but you get, you get my drift. <laughs> uh, and so all of these things make up love. And we're going to be talking about these over the next four weeks. But today, we're going to dive deeper in storge love. What is that? That's familiar love or family love. Familiar love or family love. You know, when you think about that kind of love, storge love towards something means I've become fond of it. There's a fondness that develops, um, obviously, and, and that fondness is, is, a, is an ocean that has a, a shallow end and a deep end. Don't forget that today, because that's a big idea. It has a shallow end and a deep end. And so uh, it, it's, it's really important that we see that. Like familiar love, storage love, usually begins very shallow, and then it deepens as it goes. And that's, that's an important characteristic of it. Let me try to give you some examples uh, of that. I love these shoes. Come on, somebody. You ever had a pair of shoes you're just like, mm, these shoes are my jam, right? I love these shoes. But the reality is this. Um, I love them right now because of how they fit and how they feel, but eventually they wear out and they don't fit or feel the same way. Not to mention the fact that those shoes can't reciprocate a deeper, more family-like relationship with me over time. So my relationship with loving those shoes can only go so far. You know what I'm saying? You get my drift? I love this house. This is my favorite house of all times. Yes, it, it, it's possible to love a house, but that's very shallow. Um, that's a very shallow end of the pool kind of love. I love my job. Yes, it's possible to love a job. I love this latte. Come on somebody. <laughs> yes, it's possible to have a familiar uh, love of, for a latte. Yes, I mean, this is my latte. I go and this is what I order. It's, this is my order. They know before I get here, right? You get my drift. But the reality in all of those situations is this. This is important. Those are all shallow end of the pool versions of familiar or fond love. Why? Because very, very plainly, new shoes eventually get old. Yep. New houses or, uh, you know, again, maybe not new, newly built, but just, hey, it's new in general. To me, new houses eventually become familiar. 
Again, jobs that were we loved become eventually not as rewarding. Um, lattes, we eventually get to the bottom of the glass. You know what I mean? Like it's gone and there's nothing left there, right? Objects of that nature can only swim so deep because that fondness cannot be reciprocated back. But the deep end of the pool is uh, a family kind of love. It begins with fondness or familiarness, but then as that familiarness grows and love is reciprocated between the two of us, that grows into family. And family love is where the deep end of the pool is when it comes to storge love. Let me, let me show you. I love my wife, Janelle. I've been married to my wife, Janelle, for 26 years, almost 27 years going on, uh, coming up in this March, right? Pray for my wife. No. <laughs> but, but no, in all seriousness, that's the deep end of the pool. Why? That all started with Janelle and I went on a mission trip when we were, uh, I was a senior in high school uh, and, and we, we, she would have been a, 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 going into her junior year. Um, we, we met on a mission trip to Belize, Central America. And, and in that, we became fond of each other. There was a familiarness, a fondness, but that fondness began to grow over time. Um, that storge love began to grow over time that we became more fond of each other and eventually got married and then eventually had kids. And then now 26 years later, there's a deep end, there's a deeper end of the pool when it comes to that love for each other. But make no mistake about it. I want to be clear about this. 26 years in, there are still deeper oceans to swim in. Come on, somebody, right? Let's not forget this. Go all the way back. Patient, kind, not envious or boastful, not arrogant or rude, not insisting on its own way, not irritable or resentful, not rejoicing with wrongdoing, but rejoicing with the truth. Love bears all, love believes all, love hopes all, love endures all, love never fails. 27 years coming up in March, I have a fond family love for my wife. And I'm telling you, based on that list right there, we have leagues of deep oceans to still learn how to swim in. To love each other that way? Come on, somebody. When you really think about that list, to bear all, to believe all, to hope all, to endure all, I mean, there are times that I am irritable in my love for my wife. There are times that I am arrogant in my love for my wife. There are times that I, I am rude. Do you get my drift? It's so important that we see how deep the ocean of love really is. Because a lot of times we're just saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And that's great that we say those words, but the reality is very simple. We can love each other more. How do we do it? Love God more. That's what helps us love people better. But there are deeper oceans for us to be swimming in when it comes to having this kind of love. I love my kids. Right, I can love my kids. Get like again that that's a deeper end of the pool kind of love, a family. Here's one that might surprise you. I love my church. Well, Jason, what are you talking about? Like that's not my family. That's that's a building I go to or a or a place I show up to. No, no, no. We say it all the time. Church isn't a place. It's people. It's people, and I can become fond of the people at my church. I can love the people at my church. And then as that love grows over time, they can become like family to me. That's what the Bible says. I, I didn't make that up. Th those are words right out of the Bible that I, I can love my church like that. I can love people that I do life with like that, that I have a small group with, or I'm connected with, right? I mean, it makes sense when you think family, my wife, my kids, my mother, my father, but you know, again, these people mean the world to me because of the depth of love that we share and the, the history that we have together. But we need to know that there are church relationships that we can have because we're traveling together as followers of Jesus that Jesus himself said believers should relate to one another in similar ways than a family would, right? So we can have this kind of love for each other. We can have more than just goodwill towards each other uh, as a church uh, family, we could, we could really care for each other's needs. We could really serve each other's needs. We could really be unified and genuinely care and sacrifice for each other the same way we do for our family, our immediate or biological family. Uh, again, <laughs> Jesus said these words. I, I, 
This is important. He said, Matthew 12, 50. He said, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Those are my brother and sister and mother. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven, Jesus considered you a brother or a sister or a mother. He considered you family. When you decided and I decided that we wanted to live and go after God's best, Jesus said, I consider you family. Think about that. I, I don't know about you, but when, when I asked the question earlier about when's the last time you felt truly loved? Right, right there it is. Jesus is saying, listen, if, if you're about God's will in your life, if you're about going after God's best in your life, you know, if, if you want God to be the centerpiece of your life, <laughs> you're my family. You're my brother. You're my sister. You're my mother. Again, like, like you're my family. And like, it's important that we see that we can develop these kind of loving relationships with people that maybe we never thought it was even possible to develop them with. So I guess the question that I want to wrap this message up with, with the time we have left, we only have a few, you know, about 10 minutes left here. So let me, let me just dig into this question as we wrap this up and get really, really practical today. So how do we grow deeper in our love for family? How do we grow deeper in our love for family? Right? All those family relationships, there's a lot of them. Immediate family, yes. Wife, husband, kids, mother, father, yes. Cousins, nephews, nieces, aunts, uncles, absolutely, yes. Church family, uh-huh, yep, those people too. Friends that I've really just developed a loving relationship where we're really doing life together and really caring for each other genuinely over time, yes, absolutely, absolutely. How do I grow deeper in that kind of love? Well, let me, let me just give it to you practically and some thoughts here. First thing, make the move from familiar to family where you need to in your life. Make the move from familiar to family, right? We said earlier, being fond of something or familiar with something is the shallow end of the pool, but treating it or learning to love it like family is the deep end of the pool. And so what I'm saying here is this, what are the relationships in your life that you need to start making that move with? Where, where, where you can literally start saying, I'm not just going to be familiar here. I want to move to a, a more deeper, loving relationship in this area. Let me give you some thoughts today to consider. Let's just start with God. You know, some of us just going to church on Sunday or showing up at a gathering here, um, we're, we're familiar with God. You know, we're, we're familiar. We know about God. We know maybe why it's good for us to want to get to know God, but we don't really have necessarily a, a loving relationship. Jesus just calls you his brother or sister. He said, if, if you're after the will of God in your life, you're my brother or sister. So Jesus called you family, <laughs> which means God is your father. He loves you. He's a perfect father. So think about that. Uh, it, it, the, maybe it's, for some of us today, maybe it's just making the move from treating God as something we're familiar with to really genuinely loving God deeply, like having a deep-hearted love and genuine care for God. 1 John 3, 1 explains that this way. It says, see what love the Father has given us? Look at the love that God has for you, that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. The God of the universe calls you his child. I, I don't know about you, but for me, that's mind-boggling. That God really does care about me that much. I know for years in my life, I just walked with God very familiar. I, I walked with God like to, to know God just meant to show up to church for an hour on Sunday. Just like the same to get to know my wife, uh, it just started with a couple of times where we had a conversation in a jungle in Belize, Central America. But over time, as we got to know each other more, that love grew deeper and more fond and more genuine and more caring and more loving and more sacrificial. And it's the same with God. Storge love is the same. It's the same in this, in this way. This is the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us that we would understand he wants to be our father and he wants us to love him like his children. He wants a deep, meaningful relationship with us. So maybe for you today, that's when you hear that, you go, 
Yes, that's, a, that's one of the relationships. I need to make the move from familiar to family. Here's some other ones. Your immediate family, husbands and wives. How, how, how are you treating each other? Did you hear how deep that ocean is? Think about that. Are you treating each other like familiar? Are you treating each other like roommates that live in the same house and are under the same roof? Or, or are you working to move in the direction of really being family, of really loving each other sacrificially and being unified together and caring for each other's needs, not just your own needs, right? I'm going to go back to that first list. Patience, kindness, not envious, not boastful, not arrogant, not rude. Love is not any of those. It's not rude. It's not arrogant. It's patient. It's kind. It's not, ir or it's not irritable. It's not resentful. It doesn't rejoice with wrongdoing. It bears all, believes all, hopes all, endures all. Love never fails. Think about that. In, in your immediate family relationships, husbands, wives, parents, all of us, we should definitely be thinking about those relationships. Let, let me just give you a passage. Ephesians 5.21, the Bible says this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Husbands and wives, this is talking to you. Children, this is talking to you about your parents. You, we submit to one another. We care for one another. We, we genuinely love one another. Why? Out of reverence for Jesus, the way that God loved us. That's why we love each other that way. That's important. So that's another group. Maybe, maybe it's your, your family or uh, your immediate family, husband, wife, or your kids, where you need to move from treating that relationship as familiar to treating it more like family. Here's another one, your church family. Your church family. Maybe, you need, maybe you're fond of your church family, but you're not yet family with your church family. And maybe it's time for you to make that move, to find some people that you can make that move with. That is so important. You know, the Bible is loaded, and I mean loaded, 59 times in the New Testament. The Bible encourages followers of Jesus, family, church family members to love one another. And it gives examples about how we should do that. Be at peace with each other. Love one another. Devote yourself to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Uh, stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Greet one another with a kiss. Come on, next time I see you, I'm going to give you... <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, Jason, that might be a little too far. No, seriously, seriously. For your church family, is it time to make the move from I've just been fond of my church family to no, I need to really try to focus on becoming genuinely loving towards my church family. And then the last thing I'll say, just as a suggestion, making that move, what about your neighbors? I mean, Jesus says this, um, Mark 12, 30 through 31, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So <laughs> maybe you just, some of you today, maybe you just need to start, start with becoming fond with your neighbor, like, or familiar, like take them cookies or, you know, go over and cut their grass or you know, that might cause problems. I don't know. Just do something to show them that you love them on that shallow end of the pool, because that's a great place to start. But then look for ways to build that relationship, to love them just like you love yourself. So that's the first thing. If we're going to love each other better, if we're, we're going to, we're going to make that move from familiar to family. Those are some people to consider doing that with. Next thing on the list, turn intentions into actions, turn intentions into actions. How do we grow deeper in our love for family? I, I, I need to make the move with some people from being fond or familiar to family. But then the second thing is I need to turn my intentions into actions towards them. 1 John 3.18 says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. What's that mean, Jason? Husbands, wives, parents, kids. Boy, kids, you could really freak your parents out today if you, <laughs> if you, heard, if you heard this loud and clear. Uh, again, neighbors, uh, church family, turn thoughts into thoughtfulness. Don't just think about saying something nice to somebody today. Actually, go say something thoughtful and nice to your spouse today. Come on, somebody. Kids, go say something thoughtful. Man, mom and dad, 
you, you guys work really hard and, and it, it means the world to us. Uh, you know, turn occasional time spent together into intentional time spent together. This is where in, intentions become actions. I'm not just going to occasionally spend time with you. No, I'm going to intentionally spend time with you. That's how love can grow into family love. From fond love to family love, that's how it happens. Appreciate someone today. Uh, again, don't just like appreciating someone. It really needs to become appreciation. It needs to have an object. So you can say, I appreciate my wife, husbands, but how are you showing her that you appreciate her? You can say you appreciate your husband, wives, but how are you showing him that you appreciate him? Kids, church family with each other, neighbors, you get my drift? Like, let's actually turn it into an action. Um, it, it, it's funny, you know, when you think about it, we, we, we tend to judge ourselves based on our intentions for other people. Like, I intended to bring my wife roses. I was thinking the other day I should do something nice for my wife. I intended to bring her roses. But if I didn't bring her roses, the truth is, those were just intentions. That just was floating around in my head. Love doesn't grow just because those things float around in my head. No, I need to put action to my intentions. You get my drift on that? All right, we'll move on, okay? <laughs> so in other words, be in your relationships what you want to start seeing in your family relationships. Come on, let, let, let's turn intentions into actions. Next thing, it's we got to lose the got to and find the get to in our relationships with each other. Lose the got to, find the get to. What are you saying? Mark 10, 45 says this, for even the son of man, even God himself, even Jesus did not come to be served. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for others. What do you mean, Jason? I mean this. Jesus didn't say, oh my goodness, I've got to die for these people. Ho hum. <laughs> no, no, the Bible says it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. He, he had a get to attitude. He said, again, I know this is going to be hard, but this is going to be worth it. So I need to have a get to attitude. I get to do the dishes. Come on, somebody. I get to serve my family today. I get to cook dinner tonight. I get to pray with and for those people. I get to serve others. And serving others is serving Jesus. That's essentially what Jesus said. I'm about the will of my Father. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve other people so that God would get the glory. And I think if our love for each other is to grow, to be more like family, we should have the same approach. Come on, are you getting anything out of this message? I hope you are. I hope you are. Romans 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 11. This is uh, a paraphrase of this passage, but I love this. It says, be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward him boiling hot. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with excitement as you serve him. I, I, that's a get to attitude. That's not an, oh, I've got to do the dishes. Oh, I've got to, you know, do this for my family. No, it's an, I get to do this. That attitude is what helps us move from being fond of each other to really being family with each other. Last thing today, and I'm going to wrap this message up. Come on, the, the question we ask, how do we make the move to grow deeper in our love for family? We make the move from familiar to family where we need to. We find those people that we need to make that move with. Second thing, we turn intentions into actions. Third thing, we lose the got to and we pick up the get to. And then the fourth thing, we never forget what makes it all possible. We never forget what makes it all possible. I said at the beginning and I'm going to say it again. Loving people, loving family this deeply is not in us. We can't do it on our own. We need to know where the source of that kind of love comes from, right? First John 3, again, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. 
1 John 4, 7 says this. It goes on to say, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. God is the source of this love. And whoever, lo- and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Finishing off here, pick up in verse 11. Beloved, that's us, beloved. If God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Jason, what's all that mean? It means this. You and I don't have it in us to love each other bearing all, believing all, hoping all, enduring all. Heck, if I'm being honest with you, just between me and my wife, sometimes we just struggle with being arrogant and rude to each other. (laughs) Can we be honest today? Like, but what we need to know is there's a deeper end of love. There's a deeper end, a deeper ocean that we could be swimming in, that we can be growing in. We don't have to settle for the shallow end of the pool when it comes to love. Why? Because God showed us the way. He is the source of love. And we can never forget. I don't care where our relationships are today. I don't care if we feel like we're stuck. Uh, Again, husbands and wives, if you're just stuck where you are and you don't know how to move forward, I want you to know there's hope today. People that have, uh, those of you out there today, you felt unloved. You felt like, man, I don't know that anybody loves me. I want you to know there's hope today. You are loved. God loves loves you. He is the source of love. He loves you. He wants good things for your life. Man, he thinks you're worth loving. That is so important, everybody, that we see that. Never forget when, when, when we've run out of love that, that we can have for each other or we've gotten stuck in growing in our storge, familiar, family love for each other and even with our church family, we need to remember this. Jesus makes a deeper love possible. God makes a deeper love possible for all of us. There is always hope for a deeper and stronger and more meaningful and genuine love. It's not in us, but make no mistake about it. It can be found in Jesus. As we wrap this message up today, I just want you to pray with me. You know, I don't know where you are today. Um, I hope today, maybe if you came here not feeling loved, that that you see how much God loves you today. Um, I hope that if you came here today and you're a married couple and you felt stuck, that you have hope to know that you can find deeper places of love for each other. Not, Not based on what you can do on your own, but based on what God has already done for you. What Jesus has already done for you parents and and children and family and even with your church family. You you don't have to stay stuck in just a fondness for each other. No, you can genuinely love each other. Deeply love each other like a family. All of that is available to us in Christ. And so today, I just want to pray to encourage you in that, but also just if there's someone out there today and maybe today for the first time you're, you're coming to know this love, I want to give you an opportunity today to receive that love. That's all Jesus is asking for us to do, is to receive the love that he has freely given us. And so if that's you and you're ready to receive that love today, uh, I'm going to pray in a minute and give you an opportunity to do just that. Will you pray with me? Well, God, this this message is challenging um, in so many ways. First and foremost, I just, I think about what love really is. (laughs) I think about what I've called love or how I've treated love at times. And and based on what your word says here, love is so much deeper and more meaningful and genuine than uh, sometimes we give it credit for being. 
You are love. You're the author of love. You wrote the book on love. And so God, today, this is my hope, is that you're helping us all. In whatever way that we need help, you're meeting us where we need to be met. For those that have felt unloved today, my prayer, Holy Spirit, is that you're wrapping your arms around them and they're seeing today how much you love them. For couples or families or uh, even people within church relationships or neighbors uh, where, where love is felt fractured and distant, um, I'm praying today that your loving arms are wrapping around that situation now and, and there's an understanding and a realization that hope is possible for a deeper, more meaningful and genuine love. For married couples, a deeper and more meaningful marriage. For parents and children, a deeper, more meaningful love for each other. God, please help us with this. Uh, help us not settle for just uh, the shallow end of the pool when it comes to love. No, we want the kind of love that bears all, believes all, hopes all, and endures all. So please, God, we know today that loving you more is what makes loving each other better possible. So help us do just that. Listen, today, if you're here and you're one of those people that are ready to receive Jesus' love today, just have this conversation. It's not this prayer that saves you. It's your heart in this moment. So if that's you, come on, just, just pray something like this. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I'm seeing today that you love me and you want good things for my life. I know I won't do everything right. I didn't earn your love or deserve your love, but you loved me anyway. And so today I open my heart to that truth for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time. I'm asking you today to come into my heart. I receive the love that you showed me on the cross when you gave your life for me. Will you be the leader and Lord of my life from this day forward? In Jesus' name, I pray. Come on. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer today, congratulations on what I think is the best decision you can make with your life. The decision to receive the love Jesus gave you. Uh, and if you did that, would you do me a favor today? Would you text the words, turn my feet? Just like you see, oop, just, just like you see them right here. Will you text turn my feet to 94000 right now? It would mean the world to me if you would do that. Uh, it, it lets me know that you made the decision to receive Jesus today into your heart. I can be praying for you and I'll even reach out in the days ahead with some next steps to help you on your journey. All right, gang. Well, hey, we're off and running in this series. We'll see you back next week for week number two of What's Love Got To Do? Come on, got to do with it. Until then, remember this. God loves you. He's with you. He wants good things for your life. So come on, let's go after the good things of God together. Have an amazing day, everybody. God bless. Thank you.